When we talk about yoga and sex, we are actually talking about the very same concept. At least that is what my guest today thinks. So listen in when he explains how regular sex to him and to the whole neo-tantric school is just not fulfilling enough. Drew Lawson works with what I call sex and secrets. My name is Maria Gulaer. You are listening to the Danish Yoga Podcast. And this is my third episode in English. Feel free to share it with anyone who would know this language in whichever accent. I guarantee you yet again an inspiring and challenging message. Welcome. This episode of the Yoga Podcast is about sex and secrets, and I'm here with Drew Lawson, who is a psychosexual, somatic, and sexological bodywork therapist. That's right. Is that it? Pretty much. Oh, almost. Okay. It's a long one. Um, <laughs> and a yoga teacher. <laughs> and a yoga teacher. Yeah. Yes. Welcome to the Yoga Podcast. Thank you. So you work with sex in therapeutic situations. Is that how I can understand your long title? I work with uh, our relationship to intimacy, both with ourselves and with each other. Now, most people seem to think that means sex. And so often I will be working with sexuality with clients on one level or another. So sex, how is that related to Uh, the yoga. Well, we have two words there that can mean many different things to many different people. So, um, sex, sex, yoga. Yeah. sex isn't just rubbing genitals, and yoga isn't just uh, doing fancy gymnastics on a mat. But most people, perhaps, or many people, would think that that's what sex and yoga means. Um, if uh, sex is our relationship to erotic energy, then that can be all-encompassing in how we live in the world, perhaps. Um, if, as some of the yogis would have us believe, sexual energy is the, the root energy, the source energy in our base chakras, and how that moves through kundalini energy up our spine and into the rest, into our other chakras, and, um, and how that manifests and how we send out that frequency, that vibration, then every way in which we are in the world is a manifestation of our sexual energy. Um, mm. in the same way if yoga is more than just uh, gymnastics on a mat if yoga is actually how we live our lives then um, and perhaps how to a greater or lesser extent we can make art through living our lives then sex and yoga are possibly one and the same if not close cousins mm. and you are just back from Bali where you've been uh, working for a while um, and now you're in Copenhagen now for I'm a little Copenhagen. bit. Yeah. yeah. What is it that you really want to give people here uh, or anywhere, wherever you are? What is your life mission, if you could hmm. put it like that? Uh, my current mission is to empower and enable people to to work through whatever contractions in their body, keep them from the deepest sense of intimate connections with themselves and with each other. Mm. Um, and if anything, that's just a manifestation of my own life journey. Mm. And so, so what is it that can keep us from each other? What, what is that? All the restrictions? Well, any... Um, Anything that we've, any experiences or beliefs or um, pain that we've experienced in our life that we uh, can then hold in our in our psychosomatic structure, in our body-mind, um, as a, a resistance to being fully vulnerable, being fully open, hmm. you imagine. So, you know, we're born pretty open, vulnerable beings in the world. And as we grow and go through life, Um, life happens to us and a lot of that can be experiences that we would call painful that our nervous system responds or reacts to that um that we take learnings from around if we're to stay safe we need to not do this or we need to do that or be nice or not be loud or not be angry and you know and then 
our education system, our life experience, our parents, our, you know, our uh, fellow students at school. We receive through these interactions, we receive all these learnings, which you know, often result in us putting a bunch of stuff that we used to think was okay in a big box that you know is marked not okay or else we're going to get thrown out of the gang or thrown out of the tribe or um or it's dangerous if we're this way and that structure that we then create restricts us restricts our energetic flow if we're looking at it from a from a perspective of a, a yogic perspective of energy or it restricts us in the choices we can make in our beliefs in just in our habits and how we choose to live our lives mm -hmm. so and that can turn up as, as adults or later in our lives as you know, us cutting so much of ourselves away mm. that we're we're so we're putting so much energy into presenting a mask of ourselves Facade, that will yeah. make us acceptable yeah. to our lovers our bosses our partners our colleagues to life yeah. so terrified of being rejected humiliated shamed abandoned yeah. a sense of powerlessness or so on that we're presenting a mask and that mask is so inauthentic to our true vulnerable real selves that life becomes a a, a, a plastic play and this is I assume where the secrets come in because you told me that you're working with uh, people's secrets somehow or helping them to to carry them in a way. I mean, it's absolutely related to secrets. The, um, the All these things that we believe make us unacceptable, all these ways that we've been taught we shouldn't be, whether it's our anger or our, our jealousy or our desires and so on. But... Um, When we emerge into our sexual energies, and often for, for us, it's we're very, very young. We're very tender. Three, four, five years old, we start feeling sexual energy in our bodies. Many of us, most of us, we start experimenting sexually from a very young age. You know, playing typical, you know, the typical kind of caricature of doctors and nurses, or show me yours, I'll show you mine in the playground, or you know, we start masturbating, playing with ourselves, and. Typically, for most of us, that gets shamed. That behavior gets shamed. And sometimes, you know, there's an appropriate way of holding that. You know, we don't want little Timmy taking his penis out in the playground. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want little Timmy to have a belief that his penis makes him bad. No. Mm -hmm. So how to manage and, and hold our, our emergent sexuality of, of the children is a, is a very delicate and very important question. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens... Um, you know, from little Timmy as a three-year-old to little Timmy as a twelve or thirteen-year-old coming into his his puberty, um, to how he goes, to, you know, how he interacts with with his sexual partners, male or female, as a teenager, and so on. All these learnings and shamings and and mistakes that he makes because you know we're just we're given very little sex education, so most of it is educated through our peer group or through pornography or through you know very incomplete sex education at best uh, we end up doing a lot of things that that often we regret or we feel shame about or we feel overexposed around or humiliated around um, and you know we all know how cruel teenagers and children can be for shutting that yeah. stuff down so what happens is that contributes a lot to how locked down we are as adults and then meeting in intimacy or meeting in sexuality as adults can be a for many of us a painful experience lights off all up in our heads you know am I going to be good enough am I big enough am I feminine enough am I masculine enough all of these things that show up in what can often be very very heady experiences of sexual intimacy um all facilitated by a load of alcohol mm. um and in and these are experiences that really should be somatic body worshiping moments so to come back to your question yeah. um these secrets that we hold about ourselves these these shameful thoughts memories regrets maybe it was a, a secret about a sex act that we did that we feel a lot of shame about as a young person maybe it was about a sex act that was done to us that we feel a lot of shame about i mean for lots of for example lots of people who experience what they would name as sexual abuse um feel as we grow up that there's um we had some sort of i say we because i was sexually abused as a, a i think i was about nine at the time okay um but in i, I had curiosity in that experience mm. right 
And having curiosity in that experience led as I grew up to a sense of a real strong sense of guilt. Mm. Like I shouldn't have been curious. I oh. should have fought off this man. I should have done this. I should have done that. So, so like when I was shame first of, of uh, the, participating, yeah, somehow. there was a shame yeah. in, in being curious. There was a shame yeah. in the part of me that enjoyed that experience. Yeah. Yeah. The part of me that wanted to please the grown up. The part mm. of me that wanted to be a sexual mm. man as an eight or nine year old boy. Mm. And this stuff can, you know, this weighed me down. Mm. And you know, when I'm working with clients now. Often clients will carry some sort of secret, something that they mm. feel they just can't express, whether it's sexual or, or not. I was sexual. just going to ask that: Is it always sexual? No, our secrets? Sexual. No. Um, but, but then uh, the other way around: Will it always come up in sex when we are intimate? Do you think that somehow, like it could? I could imagine it could be really hard to be. I can imagine. I've tried, okay, <laughs> to be close to someone, and then. I feel I, I have to hold a little bit back because there's something I'm not saying. Sure. So even though and how does that like, feel when you're holding back? It it doesn't feel right. Mm. I can't uh, devote myself. I can't give mm. give myself away like I maybe want to. Mm. Like I feel would be appropriate in that situation. Mm. Yeah. I mean, devotion. You said devote, and yeah. that's a beautiful word. And give yourself away. Two beautiful ways of expressing how I believe a true, authentic sex act or intimate act should be. It should, you know, it should. It can be a, an experience of the highest worship of life, of each other, of ourselves, of this present experience of celebration. And yet we carry so much story and so much baggage mm. and so much judgment about what we should be doing, how it should look, what happened to us, how, how we want, you know, many of us, most of us, are, you know, we yearn to connect. Mm. So we want to be accepted. We want to be good enough. We want to please and be pleased i mean they're you know they're virtuous longings and yearnings mm. but they manifest so often as closure and contraction and inability to speak our own needs our own desires and this inability to say what we want to ask for what we want to say when we're being touched in a way that we don't like and we live these experiences because of all of this stuff so much from our mind our bodies might be crying out no But our mind is saying, yes, I should, I should be enjoying this. This is what mm. she wants or he wants and so on. Or um or our bodies might be crying out, yes. Doesn't it have to be like that a little a little bit? Like you have to do something that you might not want to it's not your biggest desire in the whole wide world, but you're doing it to please the other person because you know this is what he loves, and then you do that and then it shouldn't be like that during sex. Is well, that what you're saying? I'm I'm not saying that we don't serve each other mm. i believe that you know if i know that there's something that you really love in in intimacy mm. then and if i love you and i want to celebrate our act then sure mm. you know i would love mm. to co-create that experience yeah. for you um but if i'm compromising my own integrity yeah that's a problem for that yeah. then that's a problem and i Absolutely. you know to use a I was, I was talking about it with a colleague last week and I don't remember the exact data but there was, it was about how many young women and by young women I'm talking about uh, girls really pubescent and often prepubescent girls are this sort of nine through to 14 or 15 years old how many of them are agreeing to sex acts with boys that boys have seen on you know on porn on their phones or what have you um, that are really strong sex acts You know, it might be anal sex, might be deep throat oral What sex. Are you saying they've seen this? So yeah, this is the sort of porn that's being handed around the playground yeah, these days. Yeah. Is hardcore porn on yeah. on um, smartphones. Mm. So you know, I'm 40 years old. The yeah. sort of porn that went around the school ground when I was a kid were sort of soft core yeah. magazines, <laughs> right? Oh. And how the effect that has on the yeah. nervous system, the effect yeah. that has on our neurology, on how we wire mm. into our dopamine and oxytocin responses in our so body. So that's really interesting because. So I'm used to thinking about Denmark. We are quite liberal uh, in terms of sex as well. Like it's legal with porn and, you know, it's all good. Um, but you're actually saying that to experience uh, true freedom, maybe we should have uh, less porn in the public. I don't um, think I'm saying that. <laughs> I think what I'm saying... In the I'll, playground anyway, then. <laughs> yes, and how do, we, how do we make less turn up in the playground? I think by normalizing it. You know, if something is forbidden, then it's everyone wants it, 
right? I remember, you know, the videos or the magazines that turned up in the playground when I was a kid, they were always nicked from under the, our parents' mattresses or from behind the back of the sock cupboard or this, that. Mm. If something is, it's, I mean, it's a very delicate balance, right? But if, if parents are cool and groovy around this, about their sexuality, then kids tend to grow up cool and groovy around their sexuality. Mm. If parents hide it or shame it or mm. ban it or don't express, you know, intimacy with, I'm not saying we should have sex mm. in front of our children, no. but I am saying if our children walk in and we're having sex, we shouldn't pretend we're doing something else okay. or yell at them and tell them to get out. And actually, I mean, we just laugh there, but I know people that, that are very cool and groovy around having sex around their kids. It's not like sit there and watch mommy and daddy have sex now, but it's kind of like we're going, we're off to have our parent time to yeah. do our intimate thing. Yeah. You know, look after yourselves or, you know, whatever it is. There's there's a, just a clear and open communication, which yeah. doesn't shame the sexual act. It doesn't make it this kind of weird, mysterious thing that, you know, kids appearing through key lockers, keyholes and yeah. trying to work out what's going on. And it doesn't to put... To natural. To, to normalise and naturalise it. Is it possible uh, to have... To think about a culture in which uh, shame is not a part of the way you, you think about sex. Because <laughs> it's like it's always there somehow, a little bit. Also just, you know, being naked, there's something shameful about that. Well, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it, you, you don't want to walk around naked all the time. There's a reason we don't do that. I don't want to walk around naked or you don't want to walk around naked. Okay, okay yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, now there are... I've just come into Denmark from Bali, as you yeah, say. Yeah, it's really so cold you, here. You, 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 you we want to put on the clothes, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, but yeah, Bali is a is a well, it's Indonesia is a Muslim country. Bali's less Muslim, but um, so Adam and Eve, right? The eating yeah. of the tree of yeah, uh, the knowledge, yeah. shame, whack yeah. on the leaf. You know, and there are a million different theories as to what this is actually a metaphor for. But uh, as we seems that as we as a species became self-aware we also introduced the idea of shame into our body systems um some sort of and sh- you know there are, so a man called john bradshaw writes very eloquently um on these two different kinds of shame healthy shame and toxic shame and he talks about healthy shame as being oh i've done something wrong right i've done something i probably shouldn't have done that maybe i shove some my little brother into the pool and oops that was you know and I felt a bit of contraction in my body a bit of humiliation a bit of shame and that's good healthy shame that's yeah. kind of good shame I've yeah. learned a boundary I've learned something I shouldn't do so yeah so healthy shame is I've done something wrong toxic shame as he describes it is I am wrong a core belief of wrongness mm. and as kids if we're if If we internalize a shameful experience, or even as adults, if if for whatever reasons around our own psychosomatic makeup or how we're held by our parents, or you know, if we're young and the gods and goddesses that are grown ups in the world really shame us in certain ways, we can take on this core belief that I am wrong, mm. and that is crippling. That just cuts mm. off the life force energy in the body, and it shuts people down, and it creates lives of misery and and separation yeah and then how can we meet others in a sexual space uh, as as how vulnerable indeed. as as we should how indeed well mm. you know we look around the world and you know that's the big challenge we have you know one of this planet is suffering from a huge sexual shadow where in all the movies in all the magazines in billboards in wherever we look sex is used to sell us stuff mm. you know we want some chewing gum here's a here's a sexy woman eating some chewing yeah. gum we want to we want to sell someone some coca-cola there's a guy with a shirt off drinking coca-cola it's yeah. all you know sex 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 yeah. perfume movies yeah. you know, in all the films there's there, you know, not in all the films but in you know, in so many of the big hollywood yeah. films there's yeah. sexuality it's this it's popping out all over yeah. the place and, and why you know, do you think that is Well, because we suppress, repress, and yeah. deny our sexual urges. Because good, healthy, natural sexuality is not allowed. And so, you know, so that that's one way where the the sexual, the repressed sexual urge pops up. Yeah. You know, another way is you know, is in all this pornography, is in all these you know, increasingly fetishized practices. And you know, I'm a huge supporter in living out all of our sexual desires and fantasies, providing they're legal. 
or finding ways of of understanding where these desires and fantasies come from, at least through conversation and, and self inquiry and so on. But you know what we're also seeing is you know every year the the vibrators that are available this year are bigger, faster, more powerful. There's and you know, there's more and more extreme cases of fetishization. Uh, yeah, and there are you know we're looking at the the kind of the recreational sex drugs. GBH and poppers, which have been around for many years, but now we've got sort of the Viagra that's been around for 10 years. And whenever you know, I do a lot of work with kind of swinger and sex party organizations in Europe, and you know, the drug of choice is Viagra for all the guys. You know, it's like, let's make sure that we've got a permanent erection and mm-hmm. let's, let's make sure that we're always on, always available. We, you know, men define their sexuality and their virility through am I big and hard enough and can mm. I keep going until I've satisfied everyone? <laughs> and, you know, and it's, it's yeah. complete as, you know, in a way, so it's, that's kind of an archetypal yearning, but it gets in the way of true in- intimacy. And so what is the alternative to that? What is that that you represent and you say, this is a better way to, to be a sexual human being? Mm. Well, i love your questions, by the way. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that we are yearning for intimacy, and yet we're always rushing towards intensity in the sexual act in our lives, and so on. It's always and it seems to be this this drive harder, faster, more all the time whether it's in sex or whether it's in shopping or whether it's in how we live our lives in the 21st century and so on so my belief my experience and that of my teachers and many of my peers is that if we can find a way to relax and slow down often and allow our nervous systems to switch from this uh, sympathetic always on Situation, which is how most of us in the West live our lives, with this kind of adrenalized cortisol alert, fight or flight kind of response. If we can get our nervous systems back into the parasympathetics, if we can get into kind of rest or tend and befriend, as it's often called, or this sense of safety, connectivity, then we can start to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And as we start to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then we start to open up and allow our authentic selves to communicate then from that place where our nervous system's relaxed, we've got oxytocin up in the body, we've got energy moving in the body. We've, if you like, it's what uh, a lot of the esoteric or energetic practices such as, as uh, Kundalini Hatha Yoga will talk about. We start moving a different kind of bioelectrical energy in the body and they might describe it in terms of Kundalini rising in the spine or the chakras opening up. Okay. Then we can start to meet other bodies in a in a place of greater depth and greater intimacy. So everything you just said, uh, apart from the last bit, is that a work done alone? One of my um, one of my dearest teachers, a man called David Cates, talks a lot about this, and I, I believe it's now an accepted scientific um, a belief, or I don't know, belief in science don't tend to meet that well, but um, he talks about the nervous system as being a bigger than ourselves so that for the nervous system to really relax into its parasympathetic expression fully it needs to be connected to other nervous systems so from that point of view um it's more challenging to do many of these practices alone okay however i'm of the belief that we can only meet another person in intimacy at the same level that we're able to meet ourselves in intimacy so i do think think that we really have to do self-inquiry and and explore our own personal depths, explore how intimate we can be with ourselves. And again, I don't mean sexually necessarily. I mean much more how we can sit with ourselves, how we can be with ourselves. Meditate. Is that what you're talking about? Meditation. Meditation. (laughs) But even, you know, what happens if we, you know, if we walk, we come home at night and we're home alone, maybe we live alone or maybe our partner's out or whatever, and the door closes and we sit down. What happens next? 
Yeah, do we reach for a glass of wine or a beer or for the TV or for the iPhone or, the, or for the podcast or whatever? <laughs> and yeah, or do we, you know, and of course there's time and a place. I'm not saying that we should sit around doing nothing the whole time, but those moments, meditators say it, it could be a minimum of 15 minutes a day. Um, but those moments where we sit and allow our bodies to, to be and to sit in a kind of a sense of a slightly unfocused awareness. You know, that kind of meditative, a little bit just back, a little bit just holding the spaciousness in our body, just to see how we feel, just to gently self-inquire, ah, what's going on? So it's actually not the, the hmm. sort of meditation where you you have your focus on your breath only and try to observe yourself from the outside and all these things you can do. It's, it's where you self-inquire. Rather. I mean, there are so many meditation tools right yeah. I mean the old the old original t- original there are old tantric sex that you know would consider eating dead flesh a meditation or, or meditating I've heard that. on oh. a corpse now, these are ways of meditating on the on the impermanence of life right oh. or staring at a candle or eating feces or you know, counting sheep or walking I mean there are many walking dancing the Sufis used Dancing is a meditation, many people do. So, but no, what I'm talking about is a more kind of a more Zogchen or Tibetan practice or a, a more the Pashna style practice of of kind of really feeling the bodily sensations. And both the Pashna and Zogchen have uh, many, many other tools inside them to uh, to guide and to inquire and to move energies. But um, I've, I've never tried the Pashna, but I've heard that it's it's really just life changing when you do it. It's where you, you you are completely in silence for however long this retreat is, right? They tend to be initial vipassana courses tend to be ten days. Ten days, yeah. And um, so just that, just the practice of not talking for ten yeah, days, yeah. is a powerful practice. Yeah. Um, and then within that, there's um, there's probably about mm, ten hours a day of seated meditation mm. um, where you're guided and then there's some audios and some videos actually from within the Gwenka tradition and there are many different traditions but Gwenka was a um, was a man who's attributed for kind of reawakening the Vipassana practice in the world um, so he's now left his body but uh, he left behind a series of audio recordings and video recordings that are used in Gwenka Vipassana centers around the world so you'll listen to this and get guided and the practice again is if you you know if you sit still for long enough, the stuff's going to come up. So this is what I was talking about when I said you shut the door, you get home, yeah. you sit down. Mm. Typically, what will arise in the body, whether, whether we're conscious or not, is some sort of discomfort, some mm. sort of contraction, some sort of agitation, mm. and whether we know it or not, and how we'll avoid that is by making ourselves busy. Is through distraction. Sometimes I just feel I'm I'm hungry. I need to pee or something. And perhaps the inquiry is if you sit with that yeah. for a minute, or take a breath into it, yeah. then maybe you realize that it's a distraction. Yeah. Maybe you actually are genuinely hungry and you can sit with the experience of being hungry yeah, for a while. I mean, too. many of us will go, oh, I'm hungry, I've got to eat something. <laughs> Without, you know, but the sitting with the experience of hunger is in itself a meditation, a practice. Um, yeah, and sitting with, the experience of maybe needing to pee. We might notice that that passes. I, I have that sometimes. Quite often I walk into a meeting or something and think, oh, maybe I need to pee. And then I realize five hours later <laughs> that I didn't. I haven't peed yet. And yeah, I've had my meeting. I've gone to lunch. I've done all of this. So it's just okay. the body changes and we conduct. You know, we were talking earlier before we started this podcast about this, about conducting the sensations in the body, feeling the contraction, feeling the tightness or feeling a an emotion or a sensation in our body that we don't like coming mm. up and taking a minute to just observe that in the body. Mm. Just go, huh, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, I felt, let's say I felt anger. Okay, I felt angry, but when I sit with that, what do I actually feel? Well, I kind of feel kind of a tightness in my chest maybe and I feel my breath's a bit short and mm. I feel that my posture's come in a bit and maybe mm. I'm clenching my teeth so 
I'm just going to breathe a while. I'm going to unclench. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to deepen my breath. Oh, what's happening? There's a tingling. There's some saliva. I notice kind of some goosebumps on my shoulders. I notice my belly soften. Oh, actually, that feels really nice now. And so all of a sudden you become aware of the sensations in the body? So when we become aware of the sensations, we notice them and the, the, the inclination to tighten our physical body, tighten our soma, and to distract and to perhaps anesthetize through alcohol or something, that disappears as we breathe with it and we're aware of it. And this is a kind of somatic experiencing technique, as I understand it then it automatically unfolds, it automatically releases. And in that release, the energy that's given off can, uh, can feel quite delicious. Okay, so what if you sit there and then the same uh, negative thoughts come up? See, for example, uh, stuff comes up that you don't really want to be in. Is it still good for you? If you're getting caught, if we're getting caught in repetitive thoughts or body responses, what uh, what we might call triggering, if the same if the same psychosomatic uh, re reactions are happening over and over again, then it's probably a good thing to do is to get some guidance mm. from someone, mm. and that doesn't necessarily mean therapy. It could mean going and talking to someone that could guide you in a particular kind of meditation or a particular mm. kind of practice. It could mean going to a body worker, mm. having some kind of physical based touch or energetic mm. touch to help remove um, or work through some of that. Um, you know, it could be an old trauma memory or something that's kind of quite deep down there in our body that, um, that is locked in that, you know, we just need some guidance and support facilitation to, to access and release. What is it that you do, the, the body work? What, what do you do? Is it like a massage? Um, it looks pretty different yeah. depending on, on who I'm working with and what I'm working with. But it's, um, it, it's there's a lot of massage-based techniques in there. There's um, a lot of yogic meditation, pranayama, type pranayama type practices in there there's um some osteopathy there's some fascial work it's i mean i feel a bit resistant using this phrase because it's, it sounds a bit like a throwaway phrase for i don't know what i'm doing but there, there's a tendon there's quite a, a reliance on an intuitive sense of what needs to be touched how mm. it needs to be touched mm. um or held And that comes from 20 years, I guess, or more of working with body work where I can, I, to a greater or lesser extent, I can look at a body and just see how the holding is happening in the body or listen to the voice, listen to the language, um, and, and get a fairly good sense of where something needs to happen. And if not, I'll just put my hands on the body. Mm. Just go, right, how does this feel? And for some people, just having a hand on a body is enough to, to trigger a release. Mm. Yeah. So it's like the body reveals uh, secrets. For sure. <laughs> well, something that's on the inside. For sure. Yeah. And this is why I don't believe necessarily that we need to sit in hours of psychotherapy. I've, I've had many hours of psychotherapy in my life. I think some sort of psycho or psychosomatic Uh, conversation is really important, mm. but I don't. We don't always need to know the data of a story in order to be able to locate and release it in the body. If the mm. body has a contraction, mm. um, a man called Peter Levine developed quite a lot of theory around trauma and, and practice around trauma. Um, he, he observed animals in nature, and he observed, for example, that um, if a prey animal is caught but then manages to escape from a predator that the first thing that prey animal often does when they're safe is to shake it out of their body. And he looked at, oh, I think, cheetahs and lions in Africa, hunting gazelles. And sometimes when the, the gazelle will go through all sorts of fight, flight uh, responses, eventually get caught often. And then sometimes that gazelle managed to escape. And when that gazelle was then safe again, what it would do is it would start shaking. It would shake out its body to release mm. the cortisol and the adrenaline and some mm. of the other hormones that were released in that experience. Now, what we tend to do as humans is if we have a traumatic experience, we tend to do the opposite. Stop the body, slow it down. I mean, sometimes there's a very 
um, physiological requirement, a very a, a need to put the body in some sort of safe protection. If we've yeah. damaged our neck, we need to get a neck brace on yeah. if we've broken bones. Yeah. But also, typically, if we have a trauma response, the our peers will say, oh, calm down, don't worry, it's okay, don't shake, just have a cup of tea, wrap you up, hold you tight. And we kind of, you know, out of the good best intentions of our heart, tend to stop those responses. If we find ourselves shaking a lot, um, we'll do what we can to, to medicate or anesthetize that. What Peter Levine and what his observations of, of the animal kingdom seem to suggest is that if we allow that shaking to happen, then that doesn't get locked into the body in, in a kind of a, a hormone photograph, a stress trauma photograph in the body. And so why I'm saying this is that if we work with releasing whatever's contracted in the body, mm. we don't need to know the story. We don't need to know that X was raped mm. by Y or, you know, a was beaten up by B at some point in their life. We just know that right now, every time B gets close to someone they want to be intimate with, their body goes, ah, no. <laughs> don't like it, run away. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. but... I, I really I really love that point because I've, um, I've experienced uh, throughout the years that when I sit and just talk about a trauma or my secrets, you know, stuff that I carry with me from my past, uh, that I make it into a project of getting the other person to understand me. Mm. And if I don't feel understood, it just it leaves me even worse off <laughs> afterwards. And so, so for me, what has been my therapy is definitely physical yoga and physical dancing. Mm. So um, practices where I can use my body and express like that. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm, beautiful. To, uh, yeah. And kind of coming back to one of your earlier questions, um, while attempting not to contradict myself, sometimes we need to share a secret. Yeah. Sometimes actually what our body is desperate to do is unburden ourselves yeah. of something that we've been yeah. carrying. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this uh, when we met the other day, where sometimes when I'm working with a client who for whom English isn't their first language and English is the only language I speak proficiently enough to be able to do my work in. Um, but if I'm, for example, if I'm working with a, uh, with a Danish client, most many Danes have such excellent English that we can do the work incredibly effectively. Yeah. But it might be that they have a, a secret that they... They it's just easier. On to. It's just easier to say it in your own language. Well, right? there are two things here, or at least two things here. One is it's easier to say it in the, our own language because that can have a often have a more direct connection to our own somatic experience. But also, it might be that just in the saying of it in Danish, they know that I don't understand. Mm. So, in the way they're, they're speaking it out loud, and they might not have even spoken it for however many years there has been since the event happened. But just speaking it, even though they know I don't understand there's still a release there's still something can shift some grief can come up some anger can come up some you know some emotion happens in the body there's a release and then it might be that later on in that session or in the next session we might revisit that and go well do you want to share it some more mm. and often just in my in my initial sort of case history session with my clients the first visit i have with my clients is almost always a um a kind of a, a bit of a case history why you're here what do you want to get out of the training mm -hmm. any significant stuff that you do feel you want to yeah. share in this moment um, typically a client will say that's the first time I've ever said those things to someone yeah. else yeah. and they'll leave with a with a spring in their step and a real lightness in their bodies just to allow themselves to be seen and heard and that's, that's wonderful when you can have that experience but sometimes I feel that I share um, in in a way that, that makes me just too vulnerable in a way. Like afterwards, I, I can't really close myself. <laughs> like mm. I, I gave away too much mm. in that moment. Mm. So that's a, the downside of it, right? Well, that's a, I mean, it's a beautiful self-awareness. Yeah. And learning how to modulate that yeah. is, um, is a real gift. And this can often come up in, again, in intimate sexual relations. You know, if we're... You know, if we meet someone and we, you know, when when and how much do we reveal of ourselves at any point? You know, mm. Maybe it's a one night stand, we meet someone in a bar and, and we have a drink or two or so we get carried away in the moment or whatever it is. Mm. And then, you know, how the next day we wake up and there's there's shame there. There's yeah. overexposure, there's vulnerability. Yeah. Or yeah. do we want to go on 
25 dates before we hold hands or what's you know this is the dance yeah. and a lot of the work that I do and I believe it's kind of the work of our time is it's a big part of of bringing ourselves back into our body and going how does my body feel about this is my yeah. body saying yes mm. or no to this question mm. is my body saying yes or no to this invitation before it's too late actually before it's too late or you know if we're coming from our mind this is how we should be or this is or we're carried along by group think or group action as hey everyone else is getting naked and jumping in the pool i should get naked and jump in the pool mm. instead of taking a couple of breaths and going oh no i don't think i want to get naked and jump in the pool right now mm. looks like fun guys yeah. and you know enjoy yourselves or yes i do Yeah, that's a good point because a lot of the times it's it's also it's about how other people think of you. That's what what brings in the fear. For sure, because you know they um, in psychosexual somatics we work with a with a handful of what are called primal fears or core fears around rejection, betrayal, worthlessness, abandonment, and powerlessness. Yeah, and many of these have qualities that are tied directly to acceptance or rejection from the group perhaps because for many thousands and millions of years you know, as we evolved through to where we are now if we were part of the group we were safe if we were mm. thrown out of the group we were less safe yeah um, perhaps even under threat and we won't certainly weren't given access to the same food resource and you know, intimacy resource and rituals and so on that you know that humans uh, so crave and enjoy um so the nervous system has grown up to try and keep itself safe you know we're not our nervous systems aren't necessarily programmed for happiness they're actually programmed to avoid pain <laughs> yeah, so so a lot of the times that's what we're looking for we're looking yeah. for you know threats we're looking for danger and so on so being able to consciously support our nervous systems into our parasympathetic response into our calm tender befriend response is um is an absolutely core practice whether it's on our yoga mat and you know we can talk about some of the challenges of, of the modern very strong vinyasa practice in yoga where again we're really stimulating our bodies really building a lot of heat and mm. uh, a lot of distraction often and busier and faster mm. and harder mm. and let's pump out a headstand and let's you know, throw in a whole bunch of vinyasas here and you know, there's no handstands over here and blah blah blah, blah. whereas Yoga, as I understand it, it's, yoga is a vehicle for for integration and, and growth. It seems to have come much more from a sense of stilling the mind way before we even bring any attention to building prana or building mm -hmm. fire in the body. Mm -hmm. So there's a my my yoga teacher, my primary teacher. Um, translates a, a yoga passage passage um, as once the moon has been made steady then the sun can be made to rise and moon is um, as code for chitta or for the mind and sun as code for prana or energy so once mm. the mind has been stilled then we can start building energy in the body and if the mind is constantly looking for threats and danger and mm. You know, to keep ourselves mm. safe and we're constantly in our, in our sympathetic nervous response mm. then we you know we've, we're really making it hard it's an uphill struggle to create the spaciousness in the vehicle that is our body in the context that is our bodily experience to then have some sort of an energetic intimate connection with ourselves and with another that feels like a more intimate place for me to know me mm. you know, a place where I can observe and self-reflect with less judgment, you know, with more humility, I guess, with more, um, with more humor, mm. actually, mm. you know, I used to, uh, I used to be incredibly judgmental and, you know, really, uh, you know, I had a lot of self-disgust and self-loathing mm. and, um, these days, very thankfully, more often I'm able to see, watch myself do or think or feel something with a bit more humor yeah and that's so, an so immense irony. relief yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um so that's just and so it's an experience of more spaciousness and if i can have some humor with myself then i can take more risks 
I'm going to be less scared to mess up and less scared to yeah. be stared at in public or yeah. less scared to be laughed at yeah. in, in an intimate sexual experience yeah. and just be more okay. If I can laugh at myself, then I take all that power away from my fear of other people laughing at me. Yeah, because you did it first. Because I got there first. <laughs> Good. And, you know, for a, um, for a public school educated English boy, that's a, yeah, that's a huge learning. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of discipline there, and it's just there. just a. I mean, it's a. It's an example of you know. I'm sure we've all got our versions of these, but you know, peer group pressure and yeah. bullying, and you know, wearing the uniform, both physical and mental, uh-huh. and you know, fitting in. Mental uniform. That's a, mm. that's the worst. <laughs> that's a, yeah. It's a straitjacket often. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So just um, let's talk a little bit more about sex. So. You, I know you have. Danish. Yes. <laughs> no, but I know you. You can say so many things about it, so I want to hear you talk. Mm. Um, and and I know you you inspired about tantra, like we started this conversation with, and that there's a certain way of uh, being in an intimate act, mm. in this, uh, when you're having sex. Mm. A certain way of doing that. Can you <laughs> tell me about that? Sure. Um. So I think I, I think I need to start this by saying that some of the practices I engage with in terms of sexuality are neo tantric at best, um, and probably more over in the spectrum of trying to bring a level of consciousness to my sexuality. Tantra itself, as a, a as an assortment of old or ancient texts of how to live as bodily beings in the world have some sexual practices in them but how that's been exported to the west and how that's then developed into this modern sort of shagging with incense that uh, you know that appears to be the face of modern tantra in the west is you know is more appropriately called neo tantra and way more appropriately called yeah conscious ish sexuality mm-hmm. Let's say the court is still out on this one, but some science that's been done into the sexual response in rats, and that sounds like a long way away, but actually rats are used quite a lot in medicine as they have very mm. similar brain chemistry to that of mm. humans. With digestion as well, actually. With digestion as well, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Um, and you know, the, well, we have a whole load of neurons in our uh, in our bellies as well, so the endemic nervous system is that actually one of these orgasms, one of these contraction pudendal type response orgasms creates a a very large spike and drop in both the oxytocin and the dopamine in the body and also a a hormone called prolactin in the body. And this uh, this huge spike and drop, then there's a refractory period that some people suggest is up to three weeks to rebuild the level of dopamine in the body. Now, I know a number of people that would argue vehemently that this is not the case, And I know a lot of people that believe it significantly has changed their experience of their energetic body and intimacy for the better when they've chosen to resist ejaculating for a period of time. Certainly the Tantra school I spent some time in the new Tantra has what they call the 21 day challenge. And the the challenge is to not have a pudendal orgasm Mm. for 21 days and see how you feel. Um, so, is it, so it is considered to be a better way of having sex to actually not come. Mm-hmm. It's this better word that I find challenging. <laughs> it's, um, it's certainly it's a subjective, but different experience on many yeah. levels. Uh, yeah. We, The human body is designed to chase dopamine highs, mm. whether we're meeting a deadline at work or trying to chat up that person in the bar or... Mm robbing a bank or doing you know jumping out of an aeroplane and blah 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 or looking at that pair of shoes we want to buy in a magazine this appears to all fit into the sort of the dopamine reward cycle in the like body like what you were just talking about with uh, vinyasa yoga like perhaps with vinyasa yoga <laughs> yes for sure um you know this this wanting something getting it having the physical experience of getting that and yeah. releasing yeah um and then you know then there's a lull you know, what some people might call buyer's remorse if we've just gone out and bought a really new expensive winter coat for the Copenhagen winters. <laughs> the next day you might sit there and go, ah, oh, did I need to spend that much money on a coat? Yeah. Um, so, there's, so there's this kind of like 
peak and trough. And, mm. you know, it, I mean, the French call it uh, le petit mort, when, uh, when the man has ejaculated and he has a the little death or has a, mm. you know, needs to have he a sleep. He falls asleep. falls asleep. Yeah, so, it's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> When, you know, when that much energy is gone, I mean, this, this opens up a whole bunch of questions about, um, you know, the different responses in, in male and females arousal patterns. So they say, I understand that, um, that the typical male sexual pattern is from penetration to ejaculation around 10 minutes. Whereas for the a typical woman to feel able to open to really start experiencing deep orgasmic energy in her body tends to be thir- three quarters of an hour or an hour mm. or it takes a lot longer let's put it that way there we go at least <laughs> yeah. so you know we can see right there that those jigsaw pieces mm. don't fit together so well mm. so just the practice of having some ejaculatory control seems like a great tool to facilitate deeper intimacy however in my own experience and i know a lot of people who don't agree with me on this, and I know a lot of people who do, in my own experience, choosing not to ejaculate for a substantial period of time increases the depth and presence and possibilities and quality of intimate experiences. Mm. I'm no longer chasing a dopamine high. I'm no longer chasing a kind of a peak hit. I'm, so, so what is it that you want when you have sex? It's it, it's not that. I have a people. very different energetic experience in my body yeah. when I'm having sex. I have, I think, what is now called a valley orgasm, or I, I experience orgasmic sensations, or I rather I experience blissful sensations in many other parts of my body. I experience a deep connectedness to my partners and to myself, and it's almost like, I mean, when it's good. And when the intimacy is there and when we're doing our breathing and when we're really meeting, the other nerves start lighting up. So um, so it's suggested that we can also orgasm on our hypergastric and our pelvic nerves. They're the nerves that run uh, into your womb, in and around your cervix, in and around your vaginal wall, your periurethral glands if you're a woman, or are kind of up into the body if you're a man, around our anuses, inside our anal cavities, um, for the guys into the lower guts, up into kind of the, the pelvic area behind the bone, a deeper, um, different kind of ner- uh, nerve, nerve stimulation in the body. And then for women also, the vagus nerve is meant to be a nerve that you can orgasm on. So it's a way of bringing high levels of bioelectrical charge to different nerves in the mm-hmm. body and creating different energetic stroke orgasmic experiences. So I've, I've had incredibly blissful experiences in my chest. I've had incredibly blissful experiences up my spine, in my head. Uh, I've had experiences where my my all this every skin, every part of the skin of my body just feels alive and vibrant. Experiences when I'm with my partner where we just seem to dissolve into each other. I mean, wonderful, beautiful, blissful experiences. So that- it is better than regular sex so it's of a higher quality that's what you said so when I when I used to ejaculate a lot mm. I was much more tired than I was now I was much mm. grumpier than I was now and I was much more conscious of when I was going to get my next ejaculation mm. and I would I would say I was quite selfish in my sexuality I was that there was a part of there was you know make sure that she comes then I can come then we yeah. can have a little nap then we can do it again you know yeah. rub 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 diddle diddle you know mm. play me but it wasn't mm wasn't fulfilling it wasn't fulfilling in the part of me that and maybe this is just me but the part of me that always really yearned for a very deep transpersonal experience of intimacy that felt like it it was possible for two or more people to meet in in a in a space that was that was sacred Mm. actually you know the almost like that you know that sacred tantric union that is talked about in a lot of the Gnostic scriptures that's talked about in in uh, in folklore and mythological wisdom in the West going back for thousands of years and in the East is talked about in Taoist sexuality and in the Tantric Union, Shiva Shakti and it turns up all over the world. So you're saying we can actually become fulfilled because uh, usually I, I experience it like that, you have sex and then after a while, you, you, you need it again somehow, <laughs> right? You become addicted. Addicted. 
uh, and and so you don't experience that hunger for sex when you are fulfilled and in bliss. I think the quality of my hunger has changed. Huh? Um, I feel a lot less hungry. Mm. Um, I certainly feel a when I when I'm intimate with another person, my yearning is now one of connection energetic connection with that person not to rub genitals until I come mm. and that was my yearning if you like for many years and mm. it's kind of this a b and c steps to the sexual act you know, I, I I could spend I can find ways of uh, it's really hard to, to kind of talk about this um, but know, sucking toes let's mm. say mm. The, the feet uh, can be mm. so sensual, can be such a blissful mm. place that you know, it's possible to get lost so for it's hours. it's finding other ways of experiencing. And for other ways of creating different cocktails of drugs in the body, if we're talking about that. Yeah. Different ways yeah. of mixing oxytocin and serotonin mm. and adrenaline and, um, and dopamine and just different cocktails that might not have that same peak and trough of the contraction orgasm, but, you know... In South America, people have chewed cocoa leaves for many thousands of years, and yet now it's been refined into crack cocaine. Crack mm. cocaine is just a massive bang up, bang down, crash out, everyone's wired at the end of it. Mm. It seems that these sorts of this sort of love making or sexual act that we're talking about has suggestions for roadmaps for teachings around this have turned up in many, many scriptures around the world for many thousands of years um and there's a parallel with cautioning against not spilling seed or not uh not ejaculating or not contracting in the orgasm um i guess i guess from an energetic an energetic metaphor might be that if if our one of our goals in life is to build a higher capacity for and quantity and quality of energy in our bodies then if we liken that to a bathtub our body being the vessel the but the bath and the water being the energy if i'm building if i'm filling my body up with with pranic water pranic energy in the form of meditation practice good food nutritious yeah. food dancing asana pranayama for me ejaculating feels like pulling the plug out oh. of the bath uh -huh. And that's kind of my experience. I feel tired, kind of bit sort of. I mean, there's, there can be this immense bliss, sure, but it doesn't last. And yeah. the later on, a few hours later, I feel, you know, empty, more cranky, more kind of contracted. And, and the body's okay um, with not coming, is it? Is it? Okay? My body loves it. Yeah. Okay. okay. And because um, you've yeah. And I think there are. I've heard stories. Okay. <laughs> there are stories, and this opens up a whole other part of um, a whole other conversation, which yeah. is. Part of my kind of my professional mission in life, which is around, um, which is around uh, really opening ourselves up for pleasure in our bodies, and I and I do a lot of work with this, particularly uh, with men. And um, what I was going to say there is that I believe it's okay if we move the energy in our bodies. Yeah. If we keep it stuck and stuck down in our genitals, then I think that can oh, cause some problems. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I know we're getting close to the end of this podcast, so yeah. we might as well <laughs> leave it on a bit of a bombshell. But I have, you know, part of one of the largest physical sex or organs in a man's body is his prostate gland. And yet most men, and particularly most straight men, think that there's something shameful, wrong, dirty, sinful about receiving pleasure on their prostates. I mean, the, the by far the easiest way to access the prostate is through the anus. Mm. But you suggest that to most straight men in the world. I won't do that. I'm not, uh, I'm not gay. I'm not... <laughs> Fuck that. So let's go drink a beer and watch football and da -da 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 -da. I just like to put my cock in women and so on. Mm. And yet, actually, there's this whole gland in the body that it contains so much pleasure so much pleasure for men it's called the male g-spot and all and these other names for it um but is there a fine line of being sexually free like that and and go into what you're saying and um and then being perverted you see i, I think right i mean, mean it's the fear for, of for me the source of that question 
is rooted in this in this patriarchal soup or in this cultural soup of it's perverted to to get pleasure in your anus mm. you know that there's something there's a shame contraction there well, what, what i mean mm. at what point i don't know what, what is perverse i think it's perverse using 12 year old girls in makeup to sell clothing in an mm. advert <laughs> yeah you know, i think that's perverted i think it's i yeah. think it's perverted that we're not allowed to be naked on a beach i think i think the world is full of really bizarre disgusting perverted acts and i don't think receiving pleasure in our bodies between two consenting adults is one of them all right and i think for straight men particularly learning how to receive pleasure in their prostates is a huge gift that will help shed layers of armoring around what it means to be really masculine what it means to be really present what it means to receive as well as to give in the world um you know i think the number of men that run around the place uh thinking that it's a great thing to have anal sex with their women like it's this big thing who'd never think of having any anything put in their own bottoms i think these men are dangerous mm. yeah because the 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 anal sphincters are like a um they're like the master switch to the nervous system the internal anal sphincter is is a key nervous system response trigger that if it's i mean people consider it autonomic but it's it's not necessarily but it's a if we if we put too much trauma there then we're we're flicking the the switches on all the other sphincters in our body and we have many many sphincters in our body that puts the body again in a sympathetic response so one bad experience in, involving the internal anal sphincter can jigger up your nervous system for the rest of your life really oh. so i've often said that if to my to my clients mm. particularly to my male clients if there's one technique one out of all of the practices that i've worked with over the 20 years i've been doing this sort of work if there's one technique it would be gentle relaxing self or mutual massage of our anal sphincters mm. and most of the world will call me a pervert <laughs> but for me that's as powerful a way accompanied with deep breathing yeah and you know the correct environment and an atmosphere of safety that's probably the most powerful way of toning calming and relaxing our nervous systems that's available to us I don't know if you're gonna answer what you just said, but I have a final question, and that is, um, if you have to choose one thing that you can uh, leave us with after this conversation, what would that be? <laughs> maybe choose another yes, okay. maybe choose something else, maybe. <laughs> Because this is this is a lot, I think, to have listened to. At least if you're not in uh, sexology yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, it's just to be curious. Yeah. It's just to be curious, curious about our own bodies, our bodily responses, how we're feeling. Just taking that pause, taking that breath, and just being curious. How does my body feel in this moment? What does my body want or need? How is the body that I'm with feeling mm -hmm. in this moment? What does this body want or need? Mm -hmm. And just you know, really seeking towards intimacy rather than intensity thank you so much Drew Lawson for thank you for you. giving me the opportunity to share and to meet you thank you thank you for listening to this interview that you might have found nothing new in in which you have been provoked or uplifted who knows just i'll just thank you for keeping an open heart with regards to yoga i do this podcast because the field of yoga is so vast that it just encompasses endless of styles schools approaches mindsets even just everyday perceptions and, and ways of thinking that are shaped by the philosophy of yoga. I'd say the wisdom of yoga goes way beyond us. So let's keep sharing. I'll do my best to make that happen. And we can learn a lot more about inner truth and bodily benefits together. You can read more about Drew Lawson at his website, drewlawson.co. I will link to it on my Facebook page as well. 
feel fantastic and free and just blessed. Until next time.